I'm Barbara Mead. I'm one of the founders of Politics and Prose, and I came in this afternoon to welcome Howard Norman. I want to give him a really big welcome since it's become harder and harder for, with each book to accommodate Howard's busy schedule. Um, Politics and Prose has been inviting him for every book for many, for many, many years, and he's always accepted. Even when he was twice nominated for the National Book Award, it was easier to get a date with him than it is now. Uh, for his memoir that was published last uh, summer, I Hate to Leave This Beautiful Place, it became impossible to get him, which was a great embarrassment to the store uh, when the book was so widely praised by book reviewers. And But now, 10 months later, we have his new novel, The Next Life Might, Might Be Kinder, which has wowed critics. Uh, the Library Journal calls his new book a strange and tragic lo love story told with great power and beauty and, it's, and highly recommended as literary fiction. Booklist calls it a dark, sexy, elusive, and diabolical tale. And Janet Maslin, writing in the New York Times, deemed it provocative, haunting, and deft with an opening sentence worth worthy of the Noir Hall of fa Fame. Uh, on a personal note, uh, Ann Beatty emailed Howard, I have never gotten this book out of my head. It's an amazing achievement. Uh, I must say that if you're a writer, Howard is really a good person to get to know. Ann Beatty, I think, uh, just discovered that. Uh, he is just wonderfully supportive of writers. And uh, he spends an awful lot of time on the telephone giving that support. I've heard that he accepts phone calls at 3 in the morning. Uh, he he accepts, accepts them collect, collect, from collect. So, so uh, if you're ever suffering from writer's block, writer's anxiety, uh, uh, even if you don't have any money in your pockets, you can, you, you can call Howard. Um, uh, despite such publishing success, Howard still has a daytime job as a professor of creative writing at the University of Maryland. Uh, teaching there is a kind of home base for many other university residencies uh, that he does elsewhere. Uh, he's just returned from uh, uh, one at, at the MFA program in creative writing at Stanford. And every summer he's done a series of writing workshops with Michael Andaji at the Summer Writer Writers Institute in Saratoga Springs. So you can see why I feel lucky to have bagged him for this evening. <laughs> so please help me in welcoming Howard Norman. truth is I beg to read here and <laughs> uh, it's the only place um, yeah um, there's many many wonderful writers here I'm not gonna point them out but I'm glad everybody came out on this beautiful day it's very very nice of you um, it's only Ron Suskind who calls it three in the morning. <laughs> but you have to forgive him because he just doesn't even know what time it is most of the time. Um, um, generally speaking, the story uh, told in this novel uh, was sponsored by the life of a dear friend who lived in Vancouver, a professor of history in British Columbia, and who had a, a very new marriage, and whose wife was in fact murdered by a hotel bellman but my intention when I first started this book many, many years ago was to simply write a love story, but a story that was against the idea of closure. I mean, if you love somebody deeply, if they are the love of your life, why, if they leave, would you ever want to experience something as limiting to your emotions as closure? That was the idea, at least, in this book. Sam Lattimore is the narrator. His wife's name is Elizabeth Church. Elizabeth was working on a doctoral thesis on the novels of the British author Marguerite Lasky, whose most famous work in real life was called The Victorian Chaise Lange. 
Elizabeth, as you'll hear in this novel, has gone so far as to purchase an actual Victorian chess lounge. The novel is written in brief vignettes, not in chronological order, because my sense is that we never remember things exactly in the order they originally happened, but more in associational patterns. So that's how this novel was composed. You'll also hear one of the exchanges that are scattered throughout this book. Um, I had access to my friend's uh, very pugilistic, confrontational uh, uh, sessions with his therapist. And so um, mostly they're about what he was experiencing. And uh, so you'll hear that every night uh, Sam sees his wife lining up books on a beach. And um, so I'm going to read just seven very short, very brief vignettes. Um, they're each titled. Elizabeth Church. <clears throat> After my wife Elizabeth Church was murdered by the bellman Alphonse Paget in the Essex Hotel, she did not leave me. I have always thought a person needs to constantly refine the capacity to suspend disbelief in order to keep emotions organized and not suffer debilitating confusion, and I mean just toward the things of daily life. I suppose this admits to a desperate sort of pragmatism. Still, it works for me. What human heart isn't in extremis? The truth is, I saw Elizabeth last night, August 27th, 1973. She was lining up books on the beach behind Philip and Cynthia Slayton's house just across the road. I've seen her do the same thing almost every night since I moved roughly 13 months ago from Halifax to this cottage. I am now a resident of Port Medway, Nova Scotia. At 3.30 a.m. sitting at my kitchen table, as usual, I made notes for Dr. Nissenson. I see him at 10 a.m. on Tuesdays in Halifax, which is a two-hour drive. I often stay at the Halliburton House Inn on Monday night and then travel back to Port Medway immediately following my session. Don't get me wrong, Dr. Nissenson is helping me a lot, but we have bad moments. After the worst of them, I sometimes can't remember where I parked my pickup truck. Then there are the numbing redundancies. Take Tuesday, when Dr. Nissenson said, my position, Sam, remains. You aren't actually seeing Elizabeth. She was, in fact, murdered in the Essex Hotel last year, and she is buried in Hayon Wai in Wales. But her death is unacceptable to you. You want so completely to see her that you hallucinate, and she sets those books out on the sand. It's your mind's way of trying to postpone the deeper suffering of having lost her. One thing books suggest is you're supposed to read into the situation, to read into things. Naturally, it's more complicated than just that. It can be many things at once, but my opinion has not changed since the first time you told me about talking with Elizabeth on the beach. My position remains that as impressively creative as your denial is, and to whatever extent it sustains you, it's still denial. My God, I said, a life without denial. How could a person survive? <laughs> you get a sense of the uh, nature of those conversations just from that exchange. Love of your life. Year after year, rain enters your diary, as the Japanese say, and an exhaustive sadness prevails. And then suddenly, one day, you find the love of your life. Happenstance or blind luck, what does it matter as long as two people meet and life is lived more intensely for all that? Because nothing brings such passionate equanimity as need met with fate. I first met Elizabeth two years ago, almost to the day on August 30th, 1971, at about 8.30 in the evening at the small Hardison Gallery on Duke Street here in Halifax. The gallery was associated with the Nova Scotia School of Art and Design. The Swiss-born photographer Robert Frank, most famous for his book The Americans and who spent summers on Cape Breton, was teaching a course at the college. And there was a lot of excitement in town about this. He also had agreed to exhibit 20 of his Nova Scotia photographs at the gallery. I was 34 and had started to write my second novel, Think Gently on Libraries. I had an apartment, I, I, I never finished that book, <laughs> actually, come to think of it. Um, I, 
I think I'd only got as far as the title. I had an apartment on Granville, right there in the neighborhood. My regular cafe was Cyrano's last night, also on Duke Street. Art students liked to hang out there. The cafe had one of those enormous espresso machines that looked like it had been designed by Jules Verne in a hallucinatory condition, like an ancient sea creature trying to breathe on land. When coffee was being made, the machine steamed and wheezed loudly, drowning out the nonstop opera, which was, much to my preference, usually Puccini or Verdi, never Wagner. Anyway, the gallery was crowded, and after moving slowly along the walls from photograph to photograph, I found myself standing next to Elizabeth, of course I didn't know her name yet, in front of a diptych called Mabu Window, which consisted of two identical views of an expanse of snowy boulders and flat rock outcroppings that led down to the sea. A section of broken wooden fence was in each foreground. The snow's glare nearly made me wince, yet there was a strangely animate quality to the light, as if I were seeing wind that contained snow moving toward the water. To me, Mabu Window was epigrammatic if a landscape study can be epigrammatic. It held a lot of muted, even spectral emotion, a kind of photographic pencil sketch of a stretch of the Cape Breton coast coming into, fog out of, com, coming into focus out of the fog. As I stood there, a touch lost in thought, lightly jostled by other people but hardly minding, I heard Elizabeth read the words Robert Frank had scrawled across the bottom. Next life might be kinder. I didn't look at her right away. And then Elizabeth turned to me and said, you probably noticed that he's written the same thing on every one of these 20 photographs. They're unsettling, don't you think, those words? We're going to have to think about them for a while. We are married. Elizabeth and I were married on January 14th, 1972. We got a marriage license from a deputy issuer, found a justice of the peace, and arranged for a room in City Hall, 1841 Argyle Street. It was bitterly cold, snowing lightly, and the wind up from the harbor found even the side streets. Still, on our walk to City Hall, Lizzie and I held bare hands inside her coat pocket. I love this old building, she said when we walked up the stairs. But there are pigeons on the roof, which means the insulation up there isn't as good as it should be. On the other hand, that's very nice for the pigeons. <laughs> we needed a legal witness, so we asked Marie Liggett, Lizzie's dear friend, a waitress at Cyrano's last night, and she was there right on time, 4.30 p.m., and was more dressed up than Elizabeth and I. After the exchange of mismatched antique rings and vows, Marie Liggett went directly back to work, and Elizabeth and I checked into room 50 at the Essex Hotel. We had already secured room 58, a four-room suite, where we would begin our life together. But we felt that it would be more romantic to spend our wedding night in a different room, even though it was just at the other end of the same floor. We had a light dinner, soup and a baguette and polished off a bottle of wine in the small restaurant off the lobby, the only customers. Late that evening, after we had made love, I was reclining in the bathtub. Elizabeth appeared naked in the bathroom doorway, holding a lit candle in an old-fashioned candle holder with a curved handle and wax catcher at the base. And after what she said, I thought I'd lose my breath from laughing. Nodding her head toward the bedroom, then languorously moving her free hand across her breasts and then down along her hips, she said in her best Mae West imitation, that was very nice, but next time, let's try it without all the mistakes. <laughs> now, um, I'm gonna read just a, a small section of a vignette called the Victorian Chaise Lange and um, uh, this is where the, they first get a glimpse of the man who eventually uh, commits this violence. The Victorian Chaise Lounge. Two mornings after our wedding, at about 8.30, there was a knock at the door. We were now set up in our apartment, room 58. We only had a bed, a desk, a rocking chair in the living room, and four ladder back chairs at the kitchen table. Elizabeth opened the door. I was sitting at the table having coffee. This was the first time we'd laid eyes on Alphonse Paget. 
He looked about 50. Later, I learned he was 43. He wore his bellman's uniform with epaulets, a bellman's cap and trousers with a dark stripe that ran the length of the legs. He was roughly six feet tall, handsome, though a bit gaunt. His black hair was slicked back, and he had a noticeable scar about three inches long, horizontal as a natural furrow on his forehead. Above his left breast pocket, Mr. Paget was stitched in gold cursive. A Mrs. Lattimore, he said, then checked a piece of paper. I have the right room, don't I? Yes, you do, Elizabeth said. And then she did an odd thing. Lizzie had on a Dalhousie University sweatshirt, jeans and black tennis shoes and socks, but immediately went in and put a sweater on. The radiators were working nicely and the apartment was well heated. Looking back, I don't comprehend this in some mystical way, like she was feeling a premonitory chill at the sight of Alphonse Paget. It was just that the sweater didn't seem necessary. When she came back to the living room, she said, I take it you're delivering my chaise lounge. Brought it up on the service lift, he said. He stepped aside, and we could see it in the hallway. My thought was, he must be physically very strong to move furniture like this. And then he picked it up and carried it into the living room and set it down. And then he said something definitely off tilt. Some men get to carry a bride over the threshold. Me, a musty old piece of furniture. He left without another word, shutting the door behind him. We more or less shrugged this incident off. Elizabeth looked so happy to see the chaise lounge. <clears throat> now I get to sit on the chaise lounge you've been telling me so much about, I said. Well, we have to break it in, Elizabeth said. She slid the sweater off over her head, and then, her hair now disheveled, began to lift the sweatshirt off. Elizabeth, you said it was from Victorian times. There's a good chance it's already been broken in. <laughs> Not by us, darling. Not by us newlyweds. T-shirt now fallen to the floor. She was naked from the waist up. She bunched up her hair and held it above her head. And whenever she held her hair up that way, it was my fall from grace. I'm going to take the rest of my clothes off and will lie down on this Victorian chaise lounge. And later, but let's give it some time, I'm going to tell you all about how I discovered Marganita Lasky, and especially her novel, The Victorian Chaise Lounge, because you'll want to know all the details. And I'm ready to tell you, and I know what you're thinking, that there's not enough room for both of us, but you know what? There's enough room if we fit ourselves together. Elizabeth removed her shoes and socks, her jeans and panties. I got out of my clothes, too, adding to the pile on the kitchen floor. I lay down on the chaise lounge. With her legs around my hips, Elizabeth slid me into her. She leaned forward, her breasts against my chest, her arms tight around my neck and shoulders, moving to her rhythm, which became mine. I'm all jostled and alert, but maybe not. I'm just not sure, she said. Fragments, like things set in sleep. I don't know where they came from. I believe she was speaking to me, though maybe as much to herself, attempting to turn over in tandem we almost fell off the chaise lounge, but managed not to. And then her legs were around my shoulders, and she pulled me deep inside and said, I was so thirsty, and now I'm not. Somehow these non sequiturs intensified everything, but I will be. And then, trembling convulsively, I'm there, and then I was. It wasn't more than three minutes, our breaths ratcheting down to near normal, before she said, stay inside me, okay, you know, for as long as you can. We lay side by side, her legs stretched over mine, and she was speaking over my shoulder, more or less into the maroon velvet back of the chaise lounge, with its ornate wooden framework and equally ornate wooden legs. I'd put things off, she said, and I had to find a topic for my dissertation. Quickly, I mean in a week. My professors were on my case. I don't blame them. They wanted good things for me. I spoke with my advisor, Professor Oshard, Oshard asked if there was anyone whose novels I secretly loved, putting it a bit provocatively, I thought. But I knew he meant novels that I thought were excellent, but nobody much talked about, let alone taught them. He wanted me to discover something, someone new, but on his behalf. I understood that right away, and I thought it was great. So I said, yes, Marganita Lasky's novels. And I was so happy, so happy, that he had never heard of Marganita Lasky. 
And here I thought he'd read everything. About every um, 12 or 15 pages, I have a still life, just a description of things in the hotel where they lived, just uh, you know, objects as mnemonic or as memory. So I'm going to read one of those. Still life with Underwood typewriter. Vivid memory being the blessed counterpart to closure, here is another still life from the Essex Hotel. On her desk, Elizabeth's black Underwood manual typewriter, a few pages of hotel stationery whose logo was a globe fitted on a wooden stand. Her favorite lace shawl on the bedpost. No, not given to me by some handsome matador in Barcelona. I found it in a thrift shop on Water Street right here in Halifax. The radiator behind her desk, like an iron accordion painted white, flaking from its own heat in winter. A framed poster of La Boheme from the Paris Opera Company, a performance that Elizabeth attended with her parents when she was 12. A scallop of peach colored soap in a black glass soap dish. I never knew why she kept it on her desk, maybe for the fragrance. An antique silent butler scuffed and marred next to her desk. On it hung her two satchels full of research, a scarf. The heat sometimes just shut off. This was usually signaled by a series of dungeon clanks from the radiator. And her black and white polka dot raincoat. Come on, what if the bathtub directly above us overflows? I don't want to have to leave my work just because it starts raining inside this apartment. Her little joke, a small oil painting of a man and woman on city streets, the man's lips pressed to the woman's ear, their arms interlocked, the title painted in small ornate letters at the bottom left, sweet nothings. A photograph of Elizabeth at her high school graduation in Heian Wai, standing with her mother and father and her Aunt Olivia. An enormous Oxford English dictionary. A teacup full of hard rubber erasers. Scotch tape to the desk. A strip of four photographs of Elizabeth and me taken in the photo booth in the mall at Historic Properties on Halifax Harbor, five or six days after we first met. Our faces touching. We already look like we know our life together is for keeps. I read it that way. Also on the desk, a big Russian blue cat named Maximus Minimum. Quote, the name of a gladiator who fights mice, Dr. Nissison said, attempting humor. I have Maximus with me in the cottage now. He's an indoor cat. Um, just two more. Uh, so I'm going to read one of the therapy sessions. Um, this is one of the more mild ones. Um, and this is where, as a novelist, you get to put your own opinions about life in, in, a, in a book. This one's called They Crossed Over. Uh, se session with Dr. Nissenson, January 23rd, 1973. Dr. Nissenson was nursing a cold. He had a humidifier on, but the sound didn't interfere with our conversation. He was wearing a woolen vest under his sports coat. The moment I sat down, I said, I saw this program on television. It's called Crossed Over. It's called They Crossed Over. The guy whose show it is, he's a charlatan. I've never seen it. Describe it for me. OK, this guy's name is David Corder. He's about 40, average looking, but so obviously average looking. Supposed to be a kind of everyman, I suppose. Regular fellow with this astonishing gift of being able to contact loved ones who have crossed over, Dr. Nissenson said. Yes. I said, and the dead are sending messages. They're sending signals of some sort exclusively to this David Corder. He's the only one who could hear these messages and deliver them to the grieving family's attention and decipher the message for them. I hate this guy. He's such a fake. He's got all these vulnerable people in the palm of his hand. I can't even imagine how much money he makes off them. I mean, he'll never run out of messages, will he? His show will run for a century. And the grieving people, do you think they are chosen beforehand, Sam? They have to be. Maybe they have to audition and prove they're the most desperate to contact their loved ones who died. The thing is, this David Quarter's pet word is closure. Let's see if we can find some closure here. He shuts his eyes. He sees a mailbox. So he says, did your father or sister or wife or who was ever crossed over, did he have 
a mailbox. <laughs> a mailbox. And the family just falls apart. They look at each other and they can't believe their ears. How could he know that? <laughs> and Dr. Nissen took a deep breath. I think you're equally disgusted by this charlatan, David Corder, and the people who volunteered to expose their neediness and naivete on television. All of the above, I said. The thing is, I've got a problem. I've become addicted to this program. I so seldom watch television, hardly ever an old movie maybe three times a week. I listen to the radio. I'm a radio person. Would you suggest I watch this program, Sam? No, that would give it a larger audience. <laughs> it, gets, it gets crankier from there, but I'll stop there. And let me, uh, let me end with um, uh, for uh, 25 years, I've been trying to put a lyric, a song by Mary McDonald, who's a somewhat obscure here, obscure um, Newfoundland uh, songwriter. She was um, raised up with the same, like uh, Kate, Katie and um, Anna McGarrigal and people like that up in Canada. <coughs> and this, um, this last vignette is called Kiss Me Upward From My Knees. Um, I should mention really briefly that uh, a job I had uh, back in the 70s, um, the CBC in Canada at one point, as you'll hear, um, uh, hired a bunch of writers, just every sort of writer, to try to recreate the uh, atmosphere of the 1940s, uh, 30s and 40s, um, and a lot of the programs that were on radio uh, during the Second World War. And the ones I mentioned are actually programs. Kiss Me Upward From My Knees. Sam, you need some employment, Elizabeth said. This was a few days, uh, this was a few months after we were in the hotel. We were down to $320 in our bank account. I'm working on my novel every day, I said. I know, I know, she said. If I know anything, I know that. But can't we take turns being the practical one? I'll go first. I saw this advertisement, and I think it would be great for you. The CBC has interesting thing going on and they're looking for writers. You could write for radio. Listen, I've got the clipping right here. CBC Radio is undertaking an ambitious recreation of the cultural atmosphere of the 1930s, 1940s, and 1950s, featuring the most popular radio entertainments of those decades. Okay, I said, I admit that does sound interesting. You can't do business with Hitler. That's one program they're hiring writers for, she said. The Shadow of Fu Manchu, that's another. But there's one I thought you'd be perfect for, darling, and I even remember hearing it on the radio when I was a little girl. It's called Mr. Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons. Melodramas about a detective named, let me guess, Mr. Keen. <laughs> Elizabeth said, I typed up and sent your resume last week, including a copy of your first novel. You already went and did that? Yes, I did. And did I get a response yet? <laughs> In fact, they called this morning when you were out. You have an interview. <laughs> Sam, my fellowship money is dwindling fast. I can waitress, I don't mind. I'd apply for the radio work myself, but my brain doesn't work that way. I couldn't make up dialogue and all that. Besides, Marganita Lasky would be too jealous a mistress. I have to stick with her. <laughs> and the interview? 4 p.m. tomorrow, the CBC office on Cogswell Street. The interview went well, and the CBC gave me four cassettes of episodes of Mr. Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons, part one through four, of the case of the author who lost his soul, which originally ran on the NBC Blue Network. For my edition, I was asked to write a fifth episode to extend the storyline, even though in the original broadcast, the story had been fully concluded. I went right back to the hotel and listened to the cassettes. Part one, the synopsis was, Jane Merrill asks Keene to locate her ex, 
Stephen Giddings, a struggling author. An unpublished novel he wrote years ago is now suddenly in demand. Giddings left Jane to wed affluent Rita Stanford. I just took these directly off the description. Second episode, Rita could support Giddings' writing lifestyle. Jane still loves him and wants to see the book succeed. Keen finds the Giddings living in Bermuda and flies down to urge Stephen to return to writing. Part three, Giddings has changed. He and Rita live now wasted, lazy existences. He hasn't written in years. Disillusioned, he's fed up with his marriage. Keen reports all this to Jane. Last episode, Mr. Keene takes Giddings, a beaten failure, back to his first wife, Jane. Giddings realizes that all his achievements sprang from the devotion and encouragement of this woman. <laughs> My wife, Jane, really loved that episode. She, <laughs> she says, play that one for me again. I, I think that's excellent. That's my favorite. Um, I played the episodes for Elizabeth that night. Oh, this will be a piece of cake for you, she said. I'm not sure I like that response. I said, S seeing the title as the author who lost his soul. It's fiction, honey. Just pretend to be somebody else. I wrote the episode and got the job. To celebrate my being employed, Elizabeth made a salad niçoise with, niçoise with creme brulee for dessert. At the kitchen table, I was typing away at my first paid assignment to extend the episodes of the case of Lucy Dare's real family, originally broadcast in 1939. Elizabeth was wearing only a denim work shirt, a few sizes too big for her, and therefore it was a shirt with a lot of possibility. It was buttoned by a single button at the navel. I'm making your favorite aphrodisiac salad for you, Sam. I bought an expensive bottle of Chablis too, way too expensive, and I couldn't be happier. She took a small fillet of tuna from the refrigerator and seared it for a few minutes in a pan slicked with olive oil. She put two eggs on to boil. She took out a head of lettuce and washed it leaf by leaf under the spigot, pressing each on a paper towel to soak up the moisture before setting it in a big wooden bowl. She put two large red potatoes cut in quarters in a pot of water and lit the flame under it. She put a handful of green beans on to boil. She took out a breadboard and cut three scallions into quarter-inch pieces and pushed them with a knife into a saucepan where she sautéed them for a minute or two in olive oil. On a separate board, she cut the tuna into quarter-inch pieces. She took out the potatoes, peeled the skin, and cut the pieces into neat rectangles. She took up the eggs with a spoon and ran each under cold water. And then she cracked and peeled their shells and sliced the eggs into the salad. She put in the potatoes and fish and scallions. She sprinkled in peppercorn, laid the green beans on top, and dropped in half a dozen or so sweet grape tomatoes. She emptied a can of white kidney beans in the bowl. She added an oil and vinegar dressing, tossed it all lightly, just twice, with long wooden spoons, and set the bowl on the table. She brought out two plates and forks and cloth napkins. She took a bottle of white wine from the refrigerator and poured us each a glass. I was famished, and the salad looked so good. Thank you for all this, I said, and reached for the bowl and wooden spoons that lay crosswise on top. But before she sat down, Elizabeth put on an album by Marianne McDonough called Winter Trees on the phonograph and set the needle on the song called Upward fiddle, guitar, and flute accompaniment with a voice straight from the Cape Breton Highlands. The first stanza was, it only takes one glass of wine to do as I please. The breeze gently unbuttons my blouse. I comb your hair with my fingers. You kiss me upward from my knees. As the song continued, Elizabeth opened the button of her denim shirt. Last night, I was reading an Acadian romance, all pounding hearts and rain, and owls at prayer in the trees. When, my sweet love, you set my book beside the pillow and kissed me upward from my knees. Get the hint, Elizabeth said. <laughs> she lay down on the Victorian chaise lounge. 
Elizabeth used to say, I have certain defining impulses. Thank you. reading out in California and after the reading um, a woman raised her hand and she said do you know where where I can get a Victorian chaise lounge I said, I said I said I don't know I'm not I don't work for antique road show you know. um, but uh, they do exist I don't know if anybody has any I will hi Mr. Howard Norman the, my question is are, are you trying to make us hungry or are you trying to make us horny <laughs> But seriously, well, Will, Will, Will um, I know you for many years, and I know you're always both. <laughs> so, um, uh, I wasn't. Yeah, I think in that vignette, I think in that vignette, I felt the whole recipe was needed, and uh, you know, I ran it by a number of people. Which is harder to write about, food or sex? <laughs> This one, uh, this story, because uh, I, I thought um, to know what, if somebody in a marriage dies that soon, to, you know, the idea would be to re try to remember everything that, that happened. So that's sort of what it was. It was more of the completeness of description. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think that um, I, I, I kind of subscribe to that middle period, that great period of Japanese writing um, between the Second World, First World War and Second World War, Inoue and Tanizaki and Kawabata and those writers. And, and Kawabata has, the, to my mind, the most wonderful description of writing sex, which is to not write it, but to create an almost unbearable sense of anticipation and then immediately an unbearable sense of nostalgia. And so that it, kind of creates the idea that you don't need the actual physical description. I didn't quite follow that precisely, but <laughs> I tried to a little bit. I may be answering by indirection well, but. Uh, that's what writers do. Great musician, teacher at the field school. Anything else? Yes. I hate to leave this beautiful place. Can you tell us a little about that? Or, I'd uh, love uh, the about the memoir? Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, it, it, uh, it's about landscape, uh, you know, that certain untoward things happen to us all, some painful things. And I didn't want to write a book just about that. You know, like I have feelings and so many memoirs are, I have a memory and I'm going to tell you what they were. Um, so I really wanted to write about some things that had happened, but more about where you go to think them through. And so there was, it was mainly about, for, for me, it was mainly about landscape, Northern California, um, Nova Scotia, Vermont. And um, it, it, it uh, I wrote about 20 or so chapters of it, and then I, I uh, distilled it down to five sort of overlapping panels. I tried to create some kind of symphonic structure there. I don't know how well it worked, but that, that's what that memoir was, uh, sort of a non-memoir in a way. Thank you. Howard, did you have a question? Or yes. Oh, hi. hi. Howard, how are you? How are you? Um, in the beginning of the book, Howard, you talk about the need to constantly refine um, the capacity to suspend disbelief. Yeah. So I was wondering if you thought that's part of the challenge of, of reading, because um, sort of that, that phrase struck me as that. And sort of, I guess sort of over the years as you've been writing, how has that struck you as, as someone writing for that kind of audience where reality has become more and more unbelievable in a way? And I think sure. writing fiction has become more challenging in that respect. Um, I think, of course, the, the ideal situation would be to <coughs> suspend disbelief in the first sentence. You know, that you enter into a book, um, fiction and nonfiction, I think. I mean, I, I, I just was reading an Arctic, uh, a book of Arctic exploration that somebody sent me. And, and the first sentence, which was as factual, Bassett, as you could possibly imagine, contained a sentence that made me need to suspend disbelief because the thing they were describing was so uncanny. 
the survival of a group of people that were locked in the ice for uh, a long time. You know, a, a kind of iconic scenario. Uh, so I, I think it, I, th I think it's just, what I meant here by suspension of disbelief is that um, uh, I, I hope that by the end of this book a reader might feel that a, a long, beautiful, wonderful marriage uh, is as strange and compelling and unpredictable on some level uh, because this book is about losing someone you love more than anyone else in the world and refuse to let them go. So it's essentially the story of a, the beginning of a long marriage. And, and I didn't mean it just metaphorically, but just how you would do anything to try to keep a person close. So um, it, I think that you suspend disbelief in daily life on certain levels. I think it's required in quotidian life um, as well as um, in fiction. Um, I really do. And, um, <clears throat> but I, I don't know that I have refined that in any philosophical sense. It's just more intuitive. I think. Kyoko. So my question is about the use of real photographers, and uh, Marganita Lasky is a real yeah. author with that, you know, novel. The Americans right behind you, Robert Frank, and I know he was in Nova Scotia. I don't know if he wrote what you know, he yes. does in your yeah. novel, um, yeah. in, in the photographs, I didn't know that, but t tell me about using those to tell a kind of a ghost story. Yeah, well, um, if you look, if you look at Robert Frank's, um, I, I didn't know this, he and I did a conversation together at the 92nd Street Y, and you know, I, w I went over to his apartment a few times beforehand, and we were talking, and I and I, I noticed that in his apartment, there were a lot, on Bleecker Street, there were a lot of photographs of his daughter. And his daughter, some of you might know, died in a plane crash um, uh, when she was just 22. And right around that period of time, he started writing this, these two aphorisms on his photographs. One was, next life might be kinder, and the other was, life dances on. So if you, if you look at photographs from that period, you'll often see that. And, uh, the, what I describe in the book is when I first saw those photographs. It was just a little uh, uh, exhibit on Harbison Street in Halifax. So, yeah, I, I, I sort of took it as a kind of talisman in a way. Um, and I don't think at all he meant, and I certainly didn't mean, some kind of prescriptive theological implication. You know, I just mean that um, the possibility that this life gets so difficult and so painful, you know, no violins, but that you start to think of alternative lives and maybe the suspension of disbelief is a way of creating an alternative life in the one we're actually living. There's a kind of duet between suspension of disbelief and feeling daily things. That's sort of the contrapuntal kind of element I was trying to get at in this book. Um, it's really, uh, a lot dealing with sort of Stravinsky's middle period. If you read those Robert Kraft interviews with Stravinsky, he talks about introducing themes and building up a sense of anticipation when that theme will come back. So he'll bring in an oboe and it'll be a very powerful statement. And then, you know, you're listening to the piece, but you're also sort of an anticipating when that might come back. And that's what I tried to do structurally in this book. Yeah. Um, sir, I haven't read your book yet, but I, have, I bought a copy. I have it here. I look okay. forward to it. But my question is, could you have written such a damaged character if Elizabeth hadn't been murdered, if, it had, if her death had been an accident or some medical pr uh, problem, but could, uh, getting back then to the husband, could you have written the, the whole story about such a damaged character? Um, well, the word damaged, I'd have to think about. I have to think about. Um, because in, there's another way to look at him. Well, there's many ways to look at any character. You refract them. But I, I would say, I mean, the argument here, in a way, 
not that there's just one argument, but one, one trope or argument here is that when, if she finally disappears and if he finally lets go of her, that's when he'll become damaged. Now, I know that sounds ethereal, but it's truer to my sense of love and experience. So you just write out of whatever your nature is. Um, so, uh, but certainly the intensifying element, the thing that sent him on this whole journey of suspension of disbelief, which he doesn't think he's doing, but the therapist does, um, started with the, mur with the murder of his wife. So I think it's the suddenness, you know, you're in your life, you come home and everything has changed. That, that I would say, um, was necessary for this story for the story I was trying to tell. I don't know if that actually gets to what you're saying, but maybe a little bit. Yeah. I'm uh, <coughs> rereading Anthony Maurer's book, A Constellation of Vital Elements. And uh, <coughs> in the chapter that I was reading this afternoon, uh, there's a discussion about a character who loses his wife. She's, she's deathly ill, but essentially he's lost. And Mara describes their relationship in terms of what they had lost that they no longer argued together, that they, they, they no longer um, uh, ate dinner together, they no longer uh, looked at flowers together. He, he, he was looking at preserving their relationship by what they did not have. How, how do you contrast that with your description? Well, I know, I just saw Tony out in California and I know that book very well. Um, yes, it, it's, a, it's a development of a, um, a sense of lost in absentia, what's not there. Um, you know, Philip Roth has, a, has a, a line in one of his books where, and I can't remember which book it is, um, the hum um, it'll come to me, uh, an older man and a younger woman and they split up and he says to her, she, he, she says to him, I'm, I'll miss all the places we never went to. So I think that kind of, that kind of negative or, or what's absence, you know, the sort of photographic negative works very well in Tony's novel. For me, I just wanted a constant, constant inventory of what he could not let go of. So in a sense, the argument would be that um, if you can keep that, it still exists. I mean, but even that sounds not quite right, but if you're asking for a contrast, I would say, that you know Conrad in one of Conrad's novels, uh, the, you know this typhoon is coming in, and a captain and a and a first mate are out in a boat, and uh, the, you know it's clearly going to be tumultuous and um, it's going to kill them, and the and the captain says, you know, I'm going to so miss having four o'clock tea, <laughs> and the contrast there is between larger forces and how we rely on ritual. And that's a little what I was trying to work with. I mean, it, it's, it's hubris to mention Conrad, but I, I did try to do that a lot in this book, to try to just, when in doubt, list everything that was in the room. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, I, I, I flew back from California a couple days ago and I sat next to this guy and we started chatting and he said, um, do you want to see, um, uh, do you want to see my uh, house? And I said, no. <laughs> I should probably stop there, but he said, I, he said, no, no, no. I mean, and, I, and, he, and he had a, a, one of those cell, you know, phones, and he toured me through like a realtor. He toured me through, um, not, not a good realtor, a bad realtor. <laughs> He toured me through the house and started giving me an inventory of everything that was in the house. Like, there's, the, there's my books, there's my such. And I really was very moved by this because I thought, we didn't talk a lot on this trip, but I thought, here's a man who, who has this close by. This is his connection, you know, he keeps this with him um, all the time. And I, I understood that. I, I really felt that that's what I was trying to do a lot in this book. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, you'll see, if you read this book, you'll see that there's one scene in which uh, Sam is away and he doesn't think he's going to get back on time. 
to see his wife and it com creates this complete panic. And so I think a lot of it's just about the nature of home, you know, a little bit. Yeah. Hey, Professor Norman. Hey. <laughs> um, I so gave you an A. <laughs> yes, you did. Thank you for that. <laughs> I don't know if I deserved it, but uh, I just wanted to ask, what was the most difficult part in writing this book in particular compared to your other ones, and how did you overcome it? Well, um, you know, uh, the fellow that this is sort of, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say based on, but I knew him quite well a long time ago. Um, I think that what happened with this book is was unusual uh, so emotionally. Uh, that, you know, you, you can get into these descriptions which sound so solipsistic and so abstract and sentimental. But um, I couldn't write this book because I couldn't figure out one of the emotions that I was feeling about it. Finally, I realized it was envy. Uh, that it, it's not that I don't have wonderful uh, love in my own life. But, but to, 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 you have to have a certain, you have to have a certain vicariousness toward your characters. You have to want to be them or else it'll fall short is my little song and dance. And if you, and if, and, and so I, I felt like where I really need to engage with this guy is the level on which he loved his wife. And, and that, and that, that created a kind of envy, um, not, not a negative reflection on my own life, but a more um, <coughs> uh, fully realized engagement with what was keeping him going. And so that, that, if you ask about difficulty, that is the difficult. I, I, as I was writing it many years ago, I knew something was missing. And I think it was that intensity of vicariousness that was missing, which you can't quantify. It just shows up in a sentence, and then you realize it's there. Um, but that's, that's, that's that. OK, we got time for one more oh, question. Okay. We, then we we're going to we be can, a, huh? <laughs> That's very funny. Uh, uh, okay, we've got okay. one last question. We're oh. running out of time. We've no problem. This is kind of just a follow-up with that question. So what? Ab how then did you also approach writing, um, you know, from the therapist character, two characters that were in opposition <laughs> to each other? Yeah, just well, um, uh, um, I, I did a conference last fall. It was a conference of all um, psychoanalysts. It was out at a hotel out by the, um, somewhere in a very nondescript place, actually, uh, n not too far from here. And, um, and, and a a a after the reading, um, I'd say there were 20 or 30 of uh, these therapists started ar arguing about the um, therapist in this book. <laughs> And I, I thought to myself, no suspension of disbelief. At all. Um, but the reason I the reason I bring that up is because is because um, my friend did leave me some descriptions of this. But uh, the the as I was almost finishing the first draft, I realized that what I really wanted was my main character not to change at all, to only deepen his convictions. And I won't give away the ending. I know how that sounds, but I think, you know, life is for the living, for full engagement and passionate engagement. And I think the therapist, I hope you'll think, came around a little bit. So they weren't just polar opposites. They weren't, he's not just a, a stereotype of what we might think. Um, so they were fun to write. I wrote so many of those uh, dialogues. Um, and then, you know, used only the amount I could use. But anyway, thank you so much. <laughs>